no further ado, I am very excited to introduce you to our keynote presenter, Aaron Smith, Manager, Research and Strategic Planning IT at Ontario Creates. Hello, uh, thank you for joining this after us this afternoon. And thank you very much to the Academy for the opportunity to share some of the Gen Z research that we did with Vice Media Group a few months ago. I'm just gonna share my screen so I'm the manager of research and strategic planning at Ontario Creates, and uh, this is our CEO, Karen Thornstone. If you are not familiar with our organization, we are an agency of the Ontario government, and our mandate is to support the economic development of the province's creative industries. And for us, that's film and television, interactive digital media, music, magazine, and book publishing. I'm excited to tell you about our research partnership with Vice Media Group and to share some of the findings about how Gen Z discovers and consumes content. I'm going to use um, the term content a bit of as a bit of a catch all here as it serves as a handy term to encompass a wide range of different media experiences. Though I totally acknowledge that nobody is like what content am I going to consume today or creators aren't usually like what content am I going to make this year, but I think it works nicely for our presentation. We worked with an amazing team at Vice, um, and that team was led by Amy Davies, who conducted the research with the help of the Vice Voices panel. Normally, Amy presents the research, but she's about to have a baby any day now, so I'm filling in for her today. Um, a little over a year ago, a team from Vice approached us about a possible research partnership around one of their audience demographics, Gen Z. The project goal was to find out how Gen Z discovers, consumes, and shares cultural content. For Ontario Creates, we support research that contributes to our mandate and that helps level the playing field between independent Ontario companies, which are very small or medium sized, and then some of the big multinational media companies that have the capacity to do a lot of um, their own uh, market research. So we wanted to help our stakeholders learn what kind of content Gen Z wants to consume and how they want to consume it. It's also important for our agency to understand how the media landscape is changing so that we can start thinking about if and how our programs and services need to adapt so that we can begin to embrace the future of content and its creators. Okay, so who are we talking about? For this study, we focused on older Gen Zers, so 14 to 22. They would now be 15 to 23 years old since we did this research about a year ago. So what did we do? Vice conducted eight in-depth interviews with different content creators that were creating content that was resonating with Gen Z or who are members of Gen Z themselves or both. They used insights from these interviews to survey 650 Ontarians that were part of their Vice Voices panel. 500 of those were members of Gen Z and 150 were millennials so that we could assess whether there were notable differences between the two generations. Here's a list of the expert interviewees. Um, they're from across the traditional sectors that we would support at Ontario Creates. And then we also interviewed some creators who make content outside of that framework, or that might be considered even influencers. So Gen Z, who are Gen Z? So for Gen Z, we see a generation where more than ever, their worldview is shifting from local to global. At the core, this is the idea that one person with a message has the power and the resources to make an impact on a global scale. For Gen Z, values are incredibly important and 74% consider themselves to be activists. They view the workforce and notions of work differently than other generations. The majority believe that ambition and creativity will drive success, not necessarily education. Creativity is seen as the most valuable skill in the workplace of the future, and most believe that they need to create their own job opportunities. Something characteristic for Gen Z, the absurd is now a reality. Shock factor has less impact. A few years ago, Vice shocked audiences with their documentary about Dennis Rodman in North Korea. Now we live in a reality where no one is surprised to see a picture of a Kardashian in the Oval Office. Regular life has become sort of Beckett level absurd. And this changes the way content creators grab and hold the attention of this audience. And finally, they live in a world fueled by media. But more than that, it is hugely important in shaping notions of self in the world around them. One in two believe pop culture and media have a bigger impact on their sense of gender and or sexual orientation than the culture they grew up with. So now on to the findings of the study. So when we're talking about original content, it was um, very important to Gen Z. So 75% expressed a desire for original content. So for them, that meant surfacing stories that had never been told before, consuming stories that make them feel differently and think differently, and presenting topics in new and different ways. So how to capture their attention. 
When we're looking at what this means for content creators, Vice analyzed the findings into four key areas that content creators should be thinking of when aiming to reach this demographic. So the first of these is diversity reflected. Diversity is very important, both in who a story is about and also who is telling it. One and two think the industry hasn't caught up with the audience in terms of diverse representation. In fact, Gen Z is more diverse than any generation prior to them and multiculturalism is increasingly the norm. 37% are persons of color and that number is projected to grow with almost half of the Canadian population over 15 being foreign born or at least having one foreign born parent 10 years from now. Sexual orientation and gender identity are very fluid for this group. 41% identified as gender neutral on a masculine and feminine scale versus only 32% of millennials. One in two Gen Zers do not identify as heterosexual. Individual diverse points of view are also important. Gen Z was more likely than millennials to follow individual creators on social media as opposed to companies or brands. And this may have some implications for how you want to market your content. It also means that content creators involvement in a project often needs to continue beyond the normal life cycle of production and well into the marketing phase. Eyes on entertainment. So what motivates Gen Z to watch, read, listen, or play something? So findings show that what's primarily driving Gen Z's content consumption is a desire to be entertained, where for millennials, there's more of an emphasis on knowledge acquisition. Um, it is tricky to tell whether the, this finding is um, age or cohort related, um, because obviously people 14 to 22 have less of a desire to consume news, for instance. Um, when compared with different, when compared to millennials, Gen Z consumes different kinds of content. Um, so they're more likely to listen to music and play video games and are less likely to watch films and television than millennials. And this won't surprise you, but second screens are important. Six in 10 are using a secondary device while watching screen content, and they're using it primarily for social media, to text friends and family, or to play games. Um, so experimentation on platforms. So social media platforms remain an integral gateway to content discoverability, but with some key differences from other generations. 78% use social media to discover cultural content, but those social media platforms are changing. So YouTube is still important, but Facebook, for instance, is losing ground with Gen Z. Uh, and then there are new platforms like TikTok that are driving music discoverability. Um, so content creators really need to meet Gen Z consumers in the places that they are frequenting and they need to do it in a genuine way to have successful engagement. While Gen Z are looking for content via social media, it usually needs to come to them through a trusted source like friends and family or even content creators themselves. Again, we're seeing that content creators are integral to the promotion and marketing of their own work. This speaks to Gen Z's need for trusted authenticity, but it also has impl sorry, implications for how content creators spend their time um, as their time seems to be needed increasingly for marketing promotion at the cost of having fewer resources to focus on the creation of new work. So the final strategy for success, distinguish your offering. So 90% of those surveyed say they pay for cultural content regularly. And if they aren't paying with their own money, they are highly influential in their family's purchasing decisions. Gen Z pay for an average of four services. For Gen Z, music streaming is the number one paid service, followed by movie and TV streaming, and then gaming in spots three to five. Notably, cable and satellite, which is the number two paid service for millennials, does not even break the top five for Gen Z. Um, and then again, going back to the point that Gen Z consumes media differently than other generations, they are less likely to watch TV weekly. So 75% of Gen Z would watch TV weekly versus 89% of millennials and they're less likely to watch movies weekly, 69% of Gen Z versus 75% millennials. They are more likely to listen to music frequently, 54% of Gen Z versus 43% millennials, and they are more likely to play video games frequently. So what makes Gen Z want to pay for content? It comes down to better quality, better experience, and convenience. And one of our interesting findings was the absence of advertising is no longer enough for Gen Z to want to pay for a service. So that was a real distinction between Gen Z and other generations. So what do these findings mean for content creators? Looking forward, content creation for Gen Z should represent the entire spectrum of diverse individuals, entertain as well as inform, enable discovery and engagement across platforms, and put quality and quantity 
over things like ad-free platforms. Um, so that's it. Thanks for listening. And as you might imagine, the research raises many more questions than it answers. We're working with VICE right now to try to figure out where we want to go from here in terms of other research questions we might want to answer. Um, you can also download the full report uh, on our website at ontariocreates.ca. And I'll come back for the Q&A in case you have questions about the research itself. And now I'll hand it back over to Melanie to introduce the panel. Hi, thank you so much, Erin. That was wonderful. I'm getting a weird alert here. I'm going to move that to the side. Can you all hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So now on to our chat. Um, entertainment reporter at ET Canada, traveling the world and interviewing the stars and straight from your youth, Carlos Bustamante is here to lead this conversation on Gen Z. And Carlos is going to be joined by our panelists, FIBA, model, stylist, curator, and cyborg lover, and Sam Demma. He's done two TEDx talks and he co-founded the Gen Z blog, Pick Waste. Welcome everybody. I'm so happy to have you here. And I hand it off. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. Hey guys, how's it going? Good, how are good, you? Good. I'm great, great. So we, I mean, we've all looked at the keynote. We, we dug in a little bit on all those, on all the numbers and the figures. Uh, I want to know though, beyond like what the numbers and the demographics are, when you think about being Gen Z or you think about the term Gen Z, like what does it mean? Does it mean anything specifically to either of you? Maybe, uh, maybe Sam, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of trying to label people with one word. So if I could boil it all down, I would say spontaneous. I think Gen Z is a very spontaneous group. Uh, I'm also a part of it. I'm 20 years old. And I think it also represents change. I think Gen Z has the power to make some massive changes on a social scale, uh, also an economic scale in the near future. So I'm really hopeful with, with uh, the, whole, the whole Gen Z, I guess, group. Mm -hmm. Bebo, what about you? I mean, I think similarly to Sam, I, I almost feel like millennials paved the way for us to be a generation of change and a generation that's a lot more radical. Um, on top of that, I see among my peers and myself, there's a much more fluid nature, um, whether that be with identity, gender, you know, self-expression. Um, and these obviously create, um, you know, create influence on economics, uh, education, creative culture, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think it, it's, impo it's, impossible. it's important for people to, um, to understand the content consumption habits of, uh, of this generation. Sam, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So, um, I mean, in order to reach any, any audience, you have to understand what they're looking for. Um, I think one thing that, that separates Gen Z from many uh, different generations is that we like to self-identify. So the, the study kind of showed that, you know, one in two people said that, uh, in, uh, said that pop culture and media kind of influenced their decisions on gender and Biba also raised it up as well. Um, and that to me means that our generation is looking for a crowd that we feel like uh, we belong to, that we feel like we fit into, but we wanna be able to self-identify. So I think that's one huge thing about content. If I feel watching something that I identify with it, I'm gonna continue watching it. Um, so that's one, that's one key thing I would, I would add there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Biba? Yeah, sort of following uh, what Sam was saying, especially in this specific era that we live in. Um, well, I've seen this a lot with brands, this sort of idea of political solidarity versus fake allyship. Um, and I think it speaks volumes, especially considering the Black Lives Matter movement um, and all of the political undergoings at the moment. I think if a brand doesn't consider intersectionality, uh, intersectionality um, and visibility, I'm not interested. So if I if yeah. I can't see any parallels between my own narrative and the brand, I lose interest. Um, yeah, if you know, not too long ago, and even now, we're still talking about um, people identifying or people being identified by maybe their uh, color of their skin or their heritage or those things. Now we're getting to this point where you want to be able to identify yourself as a, as an individual, who you are, what you represent, and you know. When it comes to brands or even people telling stories, um, 
how do you think that uh, that they can reach people with these you know these broad definitions that not broad definitions but very specific definitions um, that they've got for themselves and do it in in an authentic way where someone like you Biba would actually you know sit up and pay attention to something that somebody has to say I feel um I feel like a lot of times people of color and um, people who identify as queer are often sort of clumped in as a commodity. Um, I know a lot of modeling agencies, for instance, if they have a person of color in their roster of models, oftentimes they are not interested in having more than one, especially when it comes to Black women. So I think before we can go anywhere, I need to understand who is behind the brand who's creating the content that I'm looking at. And also, you know, is this going to be centered around narratives that are real? Or is this going to be, I don't know, I guess, um, I, I mean, is it going to be a narrative that's real and genuine versus a narrative that is more superficial? Um, I hate to call it a brand, but I know Victoria's Secret often um, uses people of color and queer bodies, especially after they have received, you know, so much um, sort of outrage from the public community for the treatment of their workers and models, for um, the misogynistic president that they had for so many years, and for them to come out with a diversity campaign seems forced. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's something to consider is the history of the brand. Where have they stood before? Are they adapting? Are they shifting? Are they themselves looking to create social change? Um, I think those are all important things to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Just Sam, to, yeah. yeah. Just to add on that, I was gonna say what it sounds like Biba is saying is that diversity specifically can't be a trend or a checklist that you check off when you're operating in this generation. And honestly, it should have never happened, but I'm, I'm glad that it's changing now. Uh, in terms of storytelling. You want to, you know, storytelling is powerful. We've told stories for thousands of years. When I was a kid, I watched stories on YTV. Now I speak telling stories on stages. Everyone wants to hear a good story. I think the key is to make sure the stories you tell uh, can be um, can be speaking to your entire audience. Don't tell a story that leaves out a certain a certain uh, color person or ho however they identify. Um, I think the stories need to be more inclusive. I think that's the, the main the main issue. You're telling stories that leave out way too many people. Exactly, and I also feel as though like if the brand's values don't align with my values, that's even if the narrative is good, I can't yeah. get behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting conversation that's happening right now, um, and it's been happening for a long time among um, people of color and among people in different communities. Uh, that's sort of just opening up now to a broader uh, conversation. But the idea of uh, where, what is centered in our stories. So, you know, we talk about stories from my community, from your community, from all these different, uh, all these different areas, all these different types of people. But it's sort of been talked about in terms of it being in relation to traditional, like um, Eurocentric, uh, straight, whatever sort of thinking, right? Is there a way that you guys can see for, um, because I, on social media, you can get around that because you're an individual. So if it's an individual that has their own channel and they're speaking about the things that they love or they believe in, that's the way for them to get out and they can do it. For a larger brand to be able to make that shift and be able to, to refocus, not just their storytelling, but their thinking, is there a way that you guys can, can see that happening? How, what's, what's the strategy you guys think? Yeah, um, I don't think it's a good idea just to start with the strategy itself. Um, I think that's, that's wrong because the how to is usually easy to find, but the, the state that you're in mentally and the story you tell yourself is even more important. And it's funny, Tony Robbins is doing a challenge on Facebook right now and he talks about this in his, in his free series. You can't start with the strategy. You have to start with something deeper rooted, the story and the state. Um, and to kind of address those things, like Biba was mentioning, if her values don't align, she doesn't even care about the story you have to tell. So I would say if you want to, you know, we all, we all at fault at some point. If your brand was at fault or if you want to shift your brand, don't just start telling a different story uh, because a story without different actions is useless. It's irrelevant. 
uh, change your values, uh, change your actions, and then because of those things, tell a brand new story. Uh, that's what I would say. I think that could be really beneficial. I think Bebo might have some interesting things to add as well, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I feel similarly, Sam. Um, I think the only difference in, in my thinking would sort of be that uh, we need to start from the root of the brand. So if you're looking at a brand that has no diversity within um, the upper levels of that brand, you know, people who are controlling and subsequently making all of those decisions, if representation does not occur at the very start, it will not occur in the right ways going forward. Um, so I think that means bringing um, the people that you want to represent, the people that you want to experience your brand into your company itself. Um, because that's the only way to make it authentic, really. Mm -hmm. um, we were looking at the numbers earlier in that keynote about, you know, where people are spending their money to view things, right? So uh, traditional cable TV was not even on that chart. And that's not really a surprise, I think, to anybody at this point in time, right? 2020, you know, there's there's so many different ways to, to consume media. But when we're talking about where we're getting our information from, where we're getting our entertainment from, um, for you guys, what are the primary sources? Who are you paying attention to? Um, are you looking at, you know, any sort of mainstream media whatsoever? Or are you looking specifically at creators that just speak to you? Um, or is it someone who is on a particular social platform? Sam? Yeah, I, um, I identify a lot with creators that I feel speak to me. I get a lot of information through them. And if it's not coming directly through those people, I get it a lot of times from my close friends that will bring up things that they think I might want to hear or, or understand because we have similar values. Uh, we make all our friends usually based on our, our values if they're not just based on proximity. So the friends that I'm with share the kind of similar mindset as me and will share information with me just through text. Um, I also spend time on TikTok, on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if I'm not getting information from friends or watching certain creators. Viva? Um, I have an interesting relationship with social media because I feel as though like, I run an art social media and I also run a personal slash more uh, modeling and styling social media. So I feel as though I almost have two different audiences and each page sort of works as a separate, um, I guess, entity. Um, but I would say that for me personally, I look towards specific individuals who maybe do have an amazing brand, but I'd like to know more about their personal history. Um, for, an ex for example, the designer Jacquemus, um, he has a page for his brand, which is a little bit more professional, um, more e-commerce. And then he also has his personal Instagram, which shows the process behind the brand, um, things that he's doing, places he's going. And it gives you a little bit of um, insight to the sort of process and the behind the scenes in his thinking, which in turn for me makes it more justifiable to spend $500 on a bag that he made. Um, so I think also just sort of humanizing the creator helps a lot. Um, yeah. Um, I think the social media thing is super interesting. I want to talk about that in terms of um, creators and maybe goals for creators as well. Uh, when we talk about uh, Instagram and TikTok, people are always talking about the algorithm. The algorithm, the algorithm helped me or the algorithm screwed me or I'm doing this for the algorithm or whatever just to get up and over. Um, and I'm curious about how you, know, how you people discover um, voices that you like, right? The, who tells you, do you see it through social media or are you talking about it just, you know, Sam, like you were saying, people texting you. Um, and what do you think about the way a creator can get themselves over, can get themselves seen, um, especially when there is so much noise? Yeah, I can start off by just saying, I think one of the main things when it, when it comes to building any sort of audience um, is polarity. Like what is your stance on issues? What is your stance on certain things going on in the world right now? Uh, because not taking a stance is a stance that not too many people in Gen Z like and don't want to hear about. I want to know what you, I, I want to know your opinions and thoughts on all social problems. Um, so that putting that stance out is creating a polar kind of opinion, which creates a polar group of people. That's why when people tell you, you know, in marketing, you have to create a niche. Who are you speaking to? And always speak to those people. Now, the reality is some people are not going to agree. Some people are going to agree. You're going to eliminate certain people, but you're going to be hyper-focused on the people that align with your values. So I think 
stating your opinions on very controversial topics and being polar is a huge, a huge piece in building your own audience. Mm. Yeah, I'm also looking for like originality. Um, I personally am attracted to a lot of creators who create one of a kind objects. Um, so I'm looking at a lot of artists um, and, and you know sculptors and, and so forth that really have a personal brand um, and that shows through in all levels of what they're doing, whether that be living their lives or in, in the content that they are creating. Um, but yeah, I would say I would say Sam pretty much nailed most of what I was going to say um, in terms of this of this uh, discussion. <laughs> cool. So you know we're we're all uh, living through one of the craziest times we've ever experienced. I want to talk about you know the the idea of the pandemic that we're in, right? Three months in, of uh, staying in your home doing everything online, communicating to people the way that we're doing right now. A lot of people had to learn how to do a lot of things very quickly, right? How to change. That being said, um, we're, we're in a climate where, again, we're absorbing our content like through this, like right here, just doing this, or on your tablet or on your computer, and you're communicating that out to people very quickly. I wanna know from you guys what you think about what this means for the relationship between viewers and creators moving forward, given that we're spending so much time on this right now, do you think this is like creating the the plateau for a new normal, or is this just sort of like an expansion of what we've been doing already? And this is just this was inevitable that we're going to be keeping going in this direction. Um, Sam, I think I'll I'll start for this one. Perfect. I think that being in, in a generation which is already deemed you know, the inter internet generation or the post-internet generation is really cool because I've been able to make so many connections um, during COVID that I could have never imagined was feasible. Um, for instance, I worked with a, a in Milan which did this initiative um, where they basically asked international artists all around the world to create a response to their new collection um, for an illustrative archive they're doing. And I probably would have never had the opportunity to work with someone in Milan had it not been a global pandemic. Um, I think it's only driven our generation to connect further online and to, to sort of radicalize that way. I mean, you've seen it with, with the political situation at the moment, with people still being able to organize and, and go to protests um, for different movements that they're passionate about despite the current situation. So I think. If anything, you know, the internet, social media, and connectivity are even more important in this current moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. I'll just add on to it a little bit. That was a great answer, Biba. Um, I think right now is a huge opportunity to build trust with an audience. So the algorithms are going crazy, and that's because everyone's spending, you know, multiple hours more per day on their cell phones consuming content. And your audience is always looking for a reason why they shouldn't trust you. And it's, if you say you're going to post something on Thursday and do a challenge and you don't show up and do it, you're going to lose a hundred, like 80% of your audience is not going to want to come back and tune back into your channel, you know? So this is a cool opportunity. So Carlos, to your, to your idea, I think it is a platform, uh, which is a, a platform to build a new, uh, new audience um, through consistency and showing up with whatever you say you're going to do online. So, I think it's a great opportunity for all. You have to just go for it and, and do what you say you're going to do. I think that's pretty much what I want to add that to that. That being said, though, it does worry me that so, because so many things are happening in the digital realm right now, you know, it, it is going to do some things in terms of communication and the way that people are able to create dialogue with one another. I even notice it when I'm walking around now. I feel... I feel a very large gap between myself and, and older generations because they're not part of those same conversations that we're having. Um, so I think that's also something that, that brands need to look at is what is it that our interests are at the moment? And you know, can you sort of predict where we're going with that? I know there's trend forecasting and so forth and so forth, but if you're not a part of the conversation from the get-go, then you can't really go that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so this speaks to, the, you know, the idea that you've got to stay connected and that brands have to uh, be listening, right? Like you guys were sort of saying before, mm -hmm. like listening to their audience and really actually paying attention as opposed to sort of saying their, 
paying attention and is trying to market something that looks like something you might like. You know, like let's have this conversation. Let's really actually have it, right? Um, an extension of the idea of brand like that, I think, is also celebrity. And I want to talk about what you know. Where is the space for celebrity in the new climate that we're in? Um, to your point, Sam, when you were talking about people not taking a stance on issues um, and how you just don't trust someone that doesn't, right? You can take a stance one way or another and you can side with that person, but if someone doesn't make a stance at all, you're just like, I don't have time for you. Yeah. Um, when a few weeks ago, when we started to see the uprising of uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, it just, uh, um, you know, you would see that celebrities were just waiting. And um, I, I had been talking to Don Lemon on, from CNN about this, about the idea of calling people out and being like, you got to take a stance, you got to say something, use your platform and say something. Um, do you think that, you know, if there's a, that there's a space for celebrities to speak to uh, an audience right now the way that they used to, or do they have to adapt as well the same way that um, brands had to adapt? And on top of that, I mean, there's a secondary question we could talk about a little bit after you guys answer the first one. But what does celebrity even mean now? Like a movie star versus someone, you know, who used to cater to a broad audience versus someone that Biba, for example, that you're a, ma a major fan of that your parents would have no idea. Uh, about so let's start with the idea of um, of the celebrities, what their place is, and how they need to um, adapt to the times. Maybe Sam, do you want to get started on that one? Yeah. So a lot of talk has been about privilege recently as well, so especially white privilege. And there's so many types of privileges, and I think that celebrities also hold a privilege, which is that of influencing millions, sometimes millions of people. Um, and I think, I think. Celebrities are human beings at the end of the day with access to a huge audience. If it aligns with your values, if it's something that means something to you and it makes you tingle and get goosebumps and makes you upset and angry, I don't see why you would hold back and not speak about it. Um, they have the power to massively shape the world and a lot of people who look up to them every single day. So I would hope that they take a stance and, and say something uh, because again, they too have a privilege and I think not using it is a huge waste. Um, yeah, and especially in a time when there's a lack of really great leadership in certain areas of the world, uh, I think they could step up and really have a huge impact on young minds who are, who are listening, following, and waiting for them to open, them, open their mouths and speak. So yeah, that's what I would say. I kind of agree with you, Sam, but I also disagree only in the sense that um, I think it's important that celebrities do the work before they are preaching to millions and millions of fans and people. Mm -hmm. um, and, as, and so, you know, for those reasons, I feel like it may be more beneficial in some cases for certain celebrities to, to you know, create a conversation with someone who actually can relate to the experience. Um, and, and if that's not them, that's okay. They can do the work, they can learn, educate themselves and still have an opinion and still have a voice. That is totally okay. Um, but I think if they decide to skip um, in learning about the situation and, and sort of just wanna jump on it because being political right now is a, is a trend. Um, and I know there's been circulating photos of different influencers in like full get-ups going to a protest just to get a photo um and that breaks my heart mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. i think it just depends which which kind of side they are taking and if it's an yeah. educated and informed side um and one of solidarity of course you know they have so so many people um listening already yeah 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 can we talk about to the second point, the idea of celebrity sort of in general. Um, for Gen Y, for millennials, uh, you know, we had this sort of cusp of watching movie stars like Leo DiCaprio, but then also being right there when YouTube started and seeing like sort of YouTube celebrities kind of blow up. And then now sort of having an idea of what the next phase of that is with different social media platforms. To you guys, what is celebrity and is it important does it hold the same sort of value that um maybe someone from an older generation might think and how does it look differently to you 
and what should it look like moving forward? I think that celebrity, it has changed. And, and yeah, I think that, uh, you know, with, with the rise of social media and people who have millions and millions of followers, Kylie Jenner, for instance, um, she formed celebrities through social media. And I think that's a thing that a lot of people are doing now with TikTok and Instagram. Um, that being said, that's not mean that, that, that does not mean that every single person will recognize them as a celebrity, but perhaps that's the view that they adopt themselves. Um, it's, it's strange. There are still real life celebrities, but if they're not on social media, they are uh, probably, I don't know, like Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> you know, like they're like people we know of, but nobody that we like know of in the moment. Like, is it, is it more important for some to like, so if I take a Robert Downey Jr. and I take like The Rock, right? If I look at Robert Downey Jr., I'm looking at his body of work in terms of like his films. When I look at The Rock and I think about him, I think more about how he connects to the people that follows him and also his body of work. So I don't want to say like who's better, but like when you're, when you're thinking about which type of celebrity and which approach has more value to you, which one does? I think the, the latter, like having a current conversation and analyzing your past work. Um, because I think like Gen Z is like very trend focused. Like we're always jumping on the next dance or like the next major topic of conversation. Um, and so if someone's not in the conversation for a long period of time, we kind of don't focus on them that much. And I might be really archaic and like old or ignorant, but like even like movie stars, like I, I'm not even very good with like uh, movie stars, their names and whatnot. Um, but I can identify a bunch of influencers on social media and TikTok. That's just me personally, but uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I think that like we live in a world now where rather than somebody knowing my name, they'll re address me by my like Instagram username when they meet me in person, which is unfortunate, but it's a reality. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think, yeah, it is a kind of celebrity for sure. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting that you that you bring that up too. You know, we've got people on, let's say uh, on Twitch, right? And you know that person by their gamer tag or their handle or whatever. Um, the idea of a platform like that, where you've got an individual who can do all the work themselves and mm -hmm. they don't need sort of a producer and they don't need someone to shoot for them and they don't whatever and they talk directly to their audience it's sort of like the idea of of the patreon thing too where you are creating something and you talk directly to your audience and they can pay you directly um i want to know you guys what what to you is kind of worth paying for like what kind of content is worth paying for now we talked a lot about being authentic and being able to relate to someone who tells stories that we believe in but um, on top of that, what is the thing that makes you go, I, you know, this is worth my money. This is worth my hard earned dollars to follow this person or to pay for this service. Uh, Biba, you, I'm gonna let you start this one. <laughs> um, I think you probably are a little more in tune with this stuff than I am, but I'll give you my opinion after. I would say there's, there's a few different things for me personally. Um, I'm vegan, so when I'm buying even beauty products, I'm looking for you know a plant-based ingredient, something that hopefully isn't too harmful to the environment as well. Um, I'm also looking a lot for sustainability um, and the length or duration that the you know garment or whatever it is that I'm purchasing, you know, how long that would last. Um, I really quite like old things, so I'm sort of a, like a thrift queen. Um, and I'm very attracted to like, yeah, just things that have sort of a story behind them. But, um, I mean, I would say there are certain things I can't live without. I pay for Spotify monthly. Never going to let that go because I listen to music 99% of the time. Um, and, and yeah, I would say like beyond that, I'm pretty much good. Like, <laughs> like in terms of like a, a platform that I like pay for like Netflix I don't even pay for Netflix because so many of my friends have it that I don't need to 
Yeah. I'm I'm in the same boat. I don't pay I like for the Netflix transparency. Either. I like the honesty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so I don't pay for Netflix either. Uh, I too use Spotify. That's like the one subscription that I pay for every single month. Um, what Biba you just said basically was that all your purchasing decisions most of the time just have to align with all your values. And I think like <laughs> it's, it's the same thing for me. It's like if this thing doesn't align with my personal values, I'm not gonna buy it. And I also do a lot of my shopping at secondhand stores. Uh, specifically Value Village. Shout out Value Village. Um, I'm a big book. I'm a big book nerd. They have a buy four get the fifth one free special. I go take advantage of that. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a value based conversation in the future. It's uh, even now. I think it's a value based conversation. But I also am. Yeah. Really, I'm really interested in meeting the creator behind whatever product it is that I'm looking at. So if that means like I go to like more artisanal markets like. Yesterday, for instance, um, Kensington Market does artisan, mar artisan markets every Sunday. Um, and I went in yesterday, met a really amazing woman. Um, she didn't have what I wanted at the time, but we developed a relationship by chatting, and she's going to make me something specifically as a commission. Um, and so I think it's also really cool to, to meet people who are working in the industry um, who can give you more than just like, a nice pair of shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny, you guys are like, um, <laughs> thinking about the Netflix thing, I was like, you guys like my parents, my parents are leeching off my Netflix. So, you know, get it, get it where you can for free. Yeah. <laughs> As, um, I was talking, we were talking about like consuming media uh, and paying for it. You know, my generation, we started sort of torrenting and pirating. And so for our value system in terms of like, what's worth paying for, we were like, yo, if we can get it for free, we're just going to get it. And then if we want the experience of going to a movie theater, you know, we'll pay for it. Currently, right now, we don't have the experience of going to a movie theater. Um, the subscription services seem to be sort of like a thing that people want to do. It's cool because it seems like a, uh, a reasonable amount of money to pay monthly for whatever you want to get. When you're talking about subscribing to... Um, music right uh, music is sort of a defining thing for every generation it's very important to every generation it tells your stories it's sort of like when you're coming up and you're growing up it's how you connect emotionally to the world if you use that right as a as a way to get your feelers out um how do you now like what is your relationship to consuming music on these services how do you guys how do you guys even organize it for yourselves like for me going coming from like having tapes when i was a kid and then buying cds and keeping like collections of cds and stuff like i still have boxes in the other room of cds i'm never going to give away um and then like hard drives full of music from downloading now you don't really need any of that stuff right so what's your relationship with streaming what catches your ear um what makes you pay attention to an artist and is it really that 15 second thing of like this doesn't get me in 15 seconds i'm gone This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Uh, before I continue, uh, I, I could jump in first. Uh, we're getting a bunch of okay, messages then, in the chat then. box about Q and A, but I will. I'll say. I'll say for me, it's the 10, 15 second thing. Um, I also have like cultural preferences. Like I love Latin music, um, and that was based off an experience I had when I was in Costa Rica dancing with local people. So I think a lot of my music personally comes. Uh, I choose based off personal experiences or things that evoke an emotional response in me. So that's what I would say about music real quick. Mm. Um, I would say for myself personally, I like to, I like to make a lot of playlists. Um, ooh, I don't even know how to begin to answer this, I'm sorry. Tough one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would say like if I want to watch a movie and it's not on, you know, one of the platforms that I do have subscriptions to, I will find the movie, you know, like that's definitely still happening from millennial to Gen Z. That's still, yeah. um, I think torrenting is less popular now, but uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, but I would say when it comes to selecting and finding music, I look a lot to, you know, what my friends are listening to. Um, I like, I like to look at different um, online platforms. So I go to like Days uh, Magazine a lot and they have like 
the top 10 albums that you should hear this month. Um, and I'll kind of like skim through that and see what I think aligns with my interests. Um, yeah, I like to just sort of discover things. There's a lot of times where I'm walking around and I hear like a snippet of a song I like and I go into my Siri, I'm like, Siri, like what song is this? <laughs> I'll screenshot that and I'll add it to the playlist. Um, but yeah, I would say like through the grapevine, also through, you know, different digital platforms that I read about. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to move over to Q&A, guys. Um, we got one here from Dave. He says, when you're looking for journalism, either original in-depth stuff or news coverage of something big like the BLM movement, what attributes attract you? Do traditional outlets ever get your attention? And if so, how? <laughs> I, uh, I'm one of those people who strongly dislikes when things are reposted and reposted and they sort of lose context and you don't even really know what the, the whole story was. Um, so when I'm looking for news, I honestly go to every single major outlet. Um, I would say, you know, like Global, Toronto Sun, Toronto Star, I pretty much read through every single one. They all have slight different perspectives, of course, and biases, but uh, I think it's important to try and get as much information as you can before you can even move on to sharing or spreading awareness about that issue. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we got another one here. As a creator who is white but wants to make a change about all the discrimination still happening in the world, are there any tips on how to help spread change through personal projects, especially projects such as works of writing? Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so I'm a member of an association called CAPS, uh, the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. And there was, a, there was one gentleman named Orlando Bowen. He does a lot of work around racism and discrimination, being a man of color and an ex-CFL player. And he was going on shows or going on um, uh, podcasts with other speakers in the association who were white of color and didn't know what to say on the topic, as Bebo was speaking about earlier, and using his experience to use their platform to share a story that's worth sharing. So as a person who's white, who wants to make a, a change, but not sure where to start, I would say, you know, write about or interview people and turn it into a body of writing um, that's depicting someone else's story who everyone could value or a value from hearing. Yeah, alternatively, yeah. you can try and create some sort of initiative where perhaps you make like a, a small zine or a small collection of poems or writing, um, and then, you know, give a portion of the profits back to uh, an organization that supports uh, people of color and women of color. Um, that's another great way to, to start to, you know, create change. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get to one that's like super relevant currently. What are your thoughts on cancel culture? Hmm. I think it's uh, something you have to be careful of. And I, I think like uh, I've been guilty of it even at the initial beginning of the movement. Um, like Bebo was saying earlier, like not everyone's ready to speak right away and not everyone knows what to say right away. Some people have to go dive in and read 15 books before they have something to share. Um, so I think it's more important that we reflect and, and, and educate ourselves on the topics and, and uh, sort of the whatever is going on in the world before we judge other people. Um, I don't think it helps the cause to judge other people. Uh, I think it, it only helps when we reflect on ourselves and, and, and educate ourselves. So that's what I would say. Eva? Um, I very much so agree. I think people are very quick to cancel someone without understanding the implications of doing so. Um, you know, it, it could really destroy someone's life. And it's tough to say, you know, it's, it's very situational, I suppose. Um, but I would say the only benefit of the current sort of mentality of canceling people is that people are resigning from positions of power where, you know, those spots can be filled by um, visible minorities and people who need to create representation in those places. So, you know, it's a give and take, I think people shouldn't be so quick to jump on on the gun but i think at the same time there are some people who it's been a long time coming um yeah so, yeah absolutely okay uh biba sam i think we're we're getting pretty close to our time here so i'm gonna wrap this up with the two of you but thank you so much for your insights this has been like an extremely useful conversation i think for a lot of people 
Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to, uh, I guess, to Aaron. Aaron's there. Aaron, are you are you jumping back on? Oh, I, I was Thank just you so here much. In, case, in case there are any um, questions about the Gen Z research that we did with Vice. Oh, well, actually, I've got one here. So this is actually good for maybe the three of you. We'll do this this last one. Um, do the panelists connect with content from older generations? So Gen X and Y, for example, is there a common thread that can be found? <laughs> I think we're very similar. I think that millennials sort of paved the way into, you know, I guess demystifying the assumption that media is not systemically organized. Um, I think that they did a lot of groundwork for Gen Zs to be able to come in and and, and pick up and, and become radical. Um, I see a lot of connections. I have a lot of friends who are um, you know, a little bit older than myself and are millennials and are working in the industry. And I think a lot of them have become mentors for myself. The main difference I notice is that Gen Z is, is a generation that is ready to create action. Um, we are, you know, we're quick. Um, whereas millennials are a little slower, they take a little bit more time and I feel like they overthink a bit too much. Um, we're just ready to, to, to create change and, and to create action. Them? Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's all about relevance. So I've been watching a bunch of old documentaries that were filmed in like early 19 or, or sorry, late 1900s uh, with my girlfriend to educate ourselves on certain topics, reading books that were written back in like 1970s. Um, so for me, it's a relevance piece. Like does this piece of multimedia, whether it's music, uh, documentaries, uh, films, or books, is it relevant to something right now that's, that needs to be learned or you know, taught to mass amounts of people? So that's how I look at it. I could definitely still uh, relate to older generation stuff. My dad always bumps 97.3 uh, in the car while we're driving, so I definitely get the old music too. <laughs> but that's what I would say about that. Aaron, what are your thoughts on this topic? Do you, uh, does this coincide with the research um, and what are your thoughts on sort of the, the way that media can swing between generations? I think one of the things the research found was that the idea of authentic storytelling was very, very important to this generation. And I think when you look at, like, particularly in the film and television sector, what content over the years has been the most successful for Canada, it's been those productions and those stories that only Canadians could tell, that only we could tell. So, I mean, everything from Little Mosque on the Prairie to Schitt's Creek, like those have been the international success stories. So I think there is, um, there is this idea of authenticity that does connect generations. Awesome. Mm -hmm. One point and I, I think that's, add... go ahead, Biba, sorry. Oh, thanks, Carlos. Um, I was just gonna add that uh, I also feel as though that sort of Canadian narrative is a little bit more important to millennials. Um, whereas I think that, um, as you discussed in, in the research, you know, Gen Z sort of sees this shift from local to global, uh, and we're constantly thinking about the next step. Um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, you can look at, um, yeah, actually, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think authenticity is really what underlines this entire thing, right? It's we want to be, uh, you want to be true to the stories that you're telling. You want to be able to do right by your audience um, by speaking to them in, in the voice that they can respect uh, and that they understand. And like you guys have been saying, story comes first, right? I, I mean, I think right. there's a really interesting idea of like looking at who the gatekeepers to stories are, and that's really changing with Gen Z. So I think there are so many more stories that we can tell. And I think it's about learning how to give voice to those stories. And I think that's happening slowly. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's a great way to end it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it right there. Thank you so much, Biba, Sam, Aaron. Again, great Thank conversation. You.